see, we have Canon, Olympus, Nikon, Nikormet, FTN with a 51.2. Hey guys, and welcome back. So today we're going to be shooting what I think is a very underrated camera. I have with me the Nikormat, or Nikormat, depending on how you want to say it, I guess, uh, FTN. And right now I have a Nikkor S 51.2 on this. It's still a Nikon, you can still use all that glass, but it's not as popular a model, and we're going to go into details on why that is later. But first, I've already talked to Josh, uh, he's going to get his camera. We're going to take this out, we're going to shoot a little bit, and uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. For the record, I'm done trying to make y'all comfortable. That's right. For the record. You ain't trying to grow then it's done for you. Right. For the record, lab on me going all the way. All the way. For the record, ain't trying to link no time to waste. For the record, 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 for the record. Been a little too nice to y'all. Now I got to up price for y'all. Snake eyes on dice for y'all. Shoulders on ice for y'all. A6 all the hay. Okay, so it's been a couple days. We got our film developed. So we're going to talk about the Nikkor Mat FTN for a little bit. And then we're going to take a look at those uh, photos and see how it worked out. So this particular camera was introduced in 1967. It's made of die cast aluminum alloy and finished in chrome plating. This is the FTN. There was first the FT. Then it was the FTN, then it was the FT2, and then finally the FT3. This is very similar to the Nikon F and the Nikon F2, which were released around the same time frame. So a lot of professional photographers around the time use this as a backup camera, where you can still use all your Nikon glass with this camera. Uh, there are a few differences between this and the F and F2, which we're going to go over right now, which is why it's uh, used primarily as a backup and not as a primary. So first off, it's not compatible with the same motor drive that the Nikon F is, and that's because it has a hinged back door, which is like this, as opposed to the Nikon F, where the whole back door comes off that way and you can put a different one on, which is why you can't use a motor drive with this camera. Another big difference is the prism on top is not removable. Uh, it's set in there, it's fixed, whereas the Nikon F, F2, and F3 all have a removable prism, which you can change out. Uh, you can change the glass in those as well. Whereas this one, uh, what you have is what you get. There are two different models uh, of this camera. There's the Nikkor Mat and then there's the Nikko Mat. The Nikko Mat is the Japanese market camera. Uh, same exact camera, only difference is the prism is a little different. Uh, but other than that, it's just made for the Japanese market. So next up is the big issue that everybody has with this camera, and that is the aperture. Now with the Nikon series, most film cameras in general, the aperture is right up here next to the shutter. However, with the Nikkor Mat, there is no shutter speed up here. So the shutter speed is actually located on the lens mount right here. You have your aperture, which is on the lens, and then right behind it is gonna be your shutter speed adjustment. So this does have a bulb mode, and then the shutter speeds go from one second to one one thousandth of a second. The battery for this particular camera is a LR625 battery. Now, I did not use the light meter on this camera when we shot with it earlier. Um, I didn't have the batteries at the time, but I've since put batteries in it, and it appears the light meter works, so I'm gonna have to test that out later. Um, but yeah, so the pictures we're gonna look at in a minute were not used with the in-camera light meter. But if you are using the in-camera light meter, the ASA is actually located on the same ring as the shutter speed on the bottom of the camera, which is kinda nice, it's out of the way, it's not up top. It leaves the top of the camera very sleek, uh, not a lot of extra things on it, everything is right here to adjust. So of course all you have left up top is your shutter and your film advance, which makes it very sleek and trim on the top, which is kind of cool, in my opinion. But again, a lot of people don't like it because it has that shutter speed on the lens. However, if you're familiar with the Olympus OM2, it has that same setup where the shutter speed is located right there on the lens mount as opposed to on top of the camera. And that camera is actually a very popular model. Um, but so for that reason, this is not sought after as much as the Nikon F and F2 series camera. Now what's nice about this camera is that the shutter speed is actually in your viewfinder. So if you're looking through the viewfinder, you can see the shutter speed in there, and we'll take a look at that in a second. However, with the original Nikon FT, there is no shutter speed in the viewfinder, so you kind of have to just know when you're adjusting in here on the lens, um, because you're not going to be able to see it anywhere else. So you kind of have to go back and forth, and I can see how that would be a little more awkward and not as enjoyable to shoot. But yes, yeah, so with this camera, you can actually see it in the viewfinder 
Let's take a look at that right now, actually. So we're gonna pull that out, scroll down. There it is, double click that, perfect. Full screen that, and let's pull up my focus ring. So you have your focus hanging right here, right in the center. We can adjust that there. And then right here at the bottom is where your shutter speed is gonna be. Now you'll have three numbers. The set in the middle that's in white, that is gonna be the shutter speed that you're currently on. The two on the sides are both yellow. Those are the ones you're not currently using. So it shows you the before and after and the one you're currently set on, which is kind of cool. So if we wanted to adjust that there, stop there, adjust it, boom, boom, good there. So you can select your shutter there. And then if we wanted to change the focus here, we can mess with that, make sure it's in focus. And good. So let's close that up, get rid of that. And so that's how that shutter speed works in the viewfinder of this particular camera. Now for me, I'm left-handed, uh, so that really doesn't bother me that the shutter speed is right there on the lens. And I also have the aperture there as well. So to me, it kind of just makes sense and it is easier. Uh, this one, I think it needs to be cleaned a little. Uh, it's a little difficult to move that shutter speed once I get into the lower numbers. So I think it just needs a good cleaning. Uh, it's not quite as smooth as I want it to be. Um, but still, I think it's kind of cool. I think the lever to adjust it could be a little bit better, a little easier to manage. Um, but I do like having it there on the lens. I think it is a cool feature to have. So because of that, this was used as a backup camera and not a primary. It was known as the poor man's Nikon because it was not quite up to par with the Nikon F and F2s, but it still had all that same quality. Um, it does not have any automatic modes. So this is a fully manual camera. You do have a light meter, so it will help you adjust your settings based on that. But you don't have aperture priority. You don't have shutter priority. Um, you have to adjust all the settings yourself. So if you're not quite comfortable with that, you might want to hold off and get something a little bit easier before jumping into a camera like this. Now as far as the viewfinder goes, it shows 92% of the actual picture frame. Also the exposure is a 60-40 split, meaning 60% of the exposure is judged on that center focusing ring, and then 40% is judged on the rest of the viewfinder. And lastly, it is a single stroke film advance, and also the on off button is a part of that film advance. And so that red dot is gonna pop up and now your camera is on, but once you push it back in, it's off and the battery is no longer being drained. But as soon as you pull that out, it is activated and you're ready to go and the light meter is going to be working. Okay, so let's take a look at a few of these pictures and see how this camera worked out. So first off, we have the shot in the alley, uh, the two buildings there to the sides. Now again, I am using a Fuji 200 speed film. Side note, always make sure you mark what film is on your camera. Um, but because I wasn't using the light meter, I didn't set that. So I thought I was using 200, I was actually using 400. So when I developed it, I actually pushed it a stop uh, just to make sure I didn't underexpose anything. And I probably should have pushed it a little bit further. But, but here's this first one. There's the classic uh, Fuji green that you're going to get a lot of times with this film. Um, next one here looks like a little bit of a light leak. Um, colors look good. You're still going to have that green, um, but everything worked out there. I really just kind of wanted to test the dynamic range of this and see if I could keep any of those highlights. Um, also keeping the shadows and of course the back and Josh without blowing it out. Um, being too underexposed. Now this one here, it was really dark in there. Um, I didn't expect this to turn out. I think I was shooting at 1 60th of a second. I didn't want to go any lower just because I didn't want shake. Um, but I figured I would try it and see what happened. It's not too bad. I could probably clean that up. Now this one, I really don't know what happened here. Uh, it was shot in the same alley as the ones before, so the lighting wasn't that bad. It was actually pretty good. Um, it was nice and soft lit. Nothing too harsh, but it wasn't in the shadows either. So. I think I just didn't fix my settings. I think I left my aperture a little too high, um, causing it to be underexposed. That or my shutter speed, one of the two. So yeah, this shot really should have came out fine, um, but it didn't, so I must have just not adjusted one of my settings uh, after taking my light reading. And so yeah, it's kind of kind of done, but that's part of film and that's what happens. Um, that's why you gotta make sure you have everything lined up. And so yeah, some are gonna turn out great, then some are gonna happen like this, but um, that's fine. These ones here, Josh took me there. Looks good, you have that green again because of the Fuji. Um, the exposures are fine, colors are great, um, no light leaks or anything like that, which we had earlier. I'm not sure how that happened, but yeah, so these look fine. Another portrait here again of Josh. Now again, we're shooting this with the 51.2, uh, so I believe this is at 1.2, so it's a really soft, very thin depth of field on that focus, uh, but it looks great. Up on that rooftop, he's very backlit here, um, but we exposed properly. He's in focus and everything, he's perfectly exposed. And the background's a little blown out, but it's sunset. Sunset's right behind him. But yeah, so that's that's just gonna happen. This one here turned out fine. You can see the moon there in the background. 
Uh, the buildings look good, everything's clear, crisp. Again here, same thing, you get those clouds. Um, the sun is actually off to the right here, I believe, for sunset. Um, so it's not as harsh lighting, not as direct. So we can get a little bit more of those colors out of the sky, uh, as well as keeping those shadows preserved too. Here we go, sunset's right there over that building there in the corner. Um, but still have a lot of great detail in those shadows. You get a little bit of those colors in the highlights. Not a whole lot, but it's still not too bad. And then lastly, this one here, Josh. I really want to show the uh, bouquet you get with this lens um, at a 1.2. It's just ridiculous. I don't think this was quite at 1.2, uh, but still you can see that building in the background is completely blown out. Um, and it's just the back of his head is in focus. And then there's a few more. I had to end up, so end up finishing off that roll in the woods um, just outside of town. Took the camera and shot in those greens. This is where that Fuji film really comes into play. Uh, those greens just really highlight and it works out really well. Um, and it's not as obvious as if you're shooting in other scenarios. So we get this portrait here. The lighting turned out great. Again, that greenish tint is not as obvious here because you're shooting in an area that's complementary to that film stock. Probably should have shot Kodak um, in the city, but we'll shoot that a different time. And this one here as well came out really cool. A little blown out there in the sky, but uh, it looks good. I think it's fine. Focus is great. Uh, exposed properly from what I can tell. So yeah, all in all, I'd say that's a solid roll of film. So again, that is the Nikkor Matte FTN. Now this camera I think is great. I think it's a little underrated. It is getting a little pricier uh, as time goes on. You used to be able to see these a lot for like 40, 50 bucks. Now I'm seeing most of them go at 100. Some people are charging 200. They're not selling it, but they're charging 200. Uh, but it is getting a little more expensive, but I wouldn't spend over 100 bucks for it. If I was to do that, I would just go ahead and get a Nikon F or an F2 for another 20, 30 bucks. Uh, depending on the model you get and the condition just because you have so much more capabilities with that camera and it does have the removable prism and you can switch out the glass that kind of thing uh, and it's just a little bit better camera so I wouldn't spend that much on this camera like I said this was used as a backup to those cameras so I don't think it's worth the same as those at all but if you want to use that Nikon glass get something that's fun a little different a little quirky this is a great camera. I'll probably shoot a lot more of it here soon. Another camera we're going to go over soon is the Minolta SRT 101 and 201. Those you can still find at really good prices. They last forever. They're built like tanks just like that camera. So they're going to last a while. It's still fully manual, so you're not going to have any of those automatic functions. But it's much cheaper. They have great color with that Minolta glass. And then another one that I think is a pretty good deal is the Fujika. Uh, we're going to go over that at a separate time too. But for now, that is the Nikkor Matte FTN. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you got something out of it. I hope it was interesting, a little different from what you're used to seeing. Um, but yeah, so keep sticking around. We got a lot more coming your way.